My name is Dr. Ed Bluth. I'm Chairman Emeritus of the Department of Radiology of the Oxford Health System in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I'm going to talk today about ultrasound of vascular emergencies. I'm going to be talking about ultrasound of vascular emergencies. There are five uh, major groupings of vascular emergencies which I'm going to discuss in this uh, lecture, uh, including deep venous thrombosis, torsion, uh, pulsatile vascular masses, acute changes in neurologic symptoms, and unusual vascular problems. These are all situations of patients who present to the emergency room and patients who are asked to assess and evaluate. Starting first with deep venous thrombosis, we're going to be discussing both the lower and upper extremity abnormalities. Acute DVT affects more than 20 million individuals in the United States and is uh, therefore a very common problem. It occurs in both sedimentary outpatients and inpatients. We have uh, several uh, predisposing factors, including a prolonged congestive heart failure, uh, surgical uh, intervention, including pelvic and lower abdominal surgery in particular, patients who have coagulopathies, and patients who are, para who are paraplegic. The important di reason for the diagnosis of acute DVT is to identify patients who uh, will have pulmonary embolism. Now, it's important to appreciate the fact that everyone who has a DVT does not develop a pulmonary embolism. But if you do not treat the DVT successfully, then in 50% of the time, a PE is likely to occur. And since in most case, in 30% of cases, the outcome of pulmonary embolism is death, this is a very important diagnosis to identify. The majority of DVT occur in the lower extremity, but there is now an increasing incidence in upper extremity DVT, as we'll discuss shortly. Now, the normal veins, both the upper and lower extremity veins, have respiratory phasicity, have spontaneous flow, have augmentation, are compressible, have flow in one direction, and are generally anechoic. Taking these important criteria, respiratory phasicity for one, uh, that refers to the venous flow changes during a respiratory cycle. So with inspiration, there is an increase in intra-abdominal pressure causing compression of the inferior vena cava and decrease in the Doppler flow signal. And with expiration, there's an increase in visualized flow. So as a result of that, you can see there's inspiration, expiration, we're asking the patient to hold their breath. Augmentation uh, relates to the increased velocity of flow uh, post uh, either valsalva maneuver or post distal compression. The normal veins can increase 50 to 200 percent on a valsalva maneuver. And as we see in this patient who initially is having quiet breathing, we're asking the patient to do a valsalva maneuver, and after that, the, the velocity of the vein has augmented uh, compared to the uh, previous uh, portion of the uh, previous time of the patient uh, doing their examination. We can also uh, change uh, and demonstrate augmentation by compressing at the ankles and better visualizing the calf veins when they're not necessarily visualized uh, with just simply color and gray scale. The most important criteria to identify and look for in veins is transverse compression. The arteries do not compress, the veins completely collapse on transverse compression. With acute DVT, the veins, as you can see here, don't compress. Here we're seeing an expanded hypochoic vein uh, with uh, loss of uh, compressibility. Important also to appreciate is that as an indirect sign, there's a loss of respiratory phasicity. We'll refer to that later on in the lecture. The lower extremities uh, uh, demonstrate the parameters we just discussed. Uh, the veins we normally assess include the common femoral, deep femoral, superficial, profunda femoral, common femoral, posterior tibial, anterior tibial, and uh, perineal veins. With transverse compression in a patient who has acute DVT, the vessel uh, remains hyper-expanded hyper and is anechoic. Uh, 
The ACR standards at the present time require only assessment of common femoral, superficial femoral, and popliteal veins. But when there is focal calf pain, uh, this generally requires a complete assessment of, those, uh, of that particular area and the calf veins. The important issue of uh, isolated calf veins is that in 80% of isolated thrombi, uh, they will resol re resolve spontaneously. In only 20% will they extend proximally. Commonly, however, patients who have calf veins will also have an associated higher uh, venous thrombus in one of the upper vessels as well. So therefore, uh, since uh, patients who will have a negative ultrasound if uh, the calf veins are not completely assessed and they remain symptomatic or repeat ultrasound is advised to be certain that that patient does not fit into that 20% who, proxim who propagate proximally. This is an example of early DVT. Here we're seeing residual, th or we're seeing a sp uh, thrombus just at the uh, level of one of the valves. And you can appreciate that as that, uh, val as that thrombus begins to uh, uh, regress, uh, that uh, the valves can be uh, destroyed, leading ultimately to uh, venous incompetence. On the other end of the spectrum is this patient who has a large amount of thrombus uh, distending completely the common femoral, greatest uh, superficial femoral vein, and the uh, profunda femoral here in both sagittal and transverse uh, dimensions. As I said, we evaluate the uh, uh, venous structures both uh, directly with grayscale and uh, with and also with color and also with Doppler spectrum analysis, looking for asymmetry. Here, if we look on the right side, there is a loss of respiratory phasicity compared to the normal left side. Putting the two sides together again, loss of respiratory phasicity on the right compared to the better respiratory phasicity we're seeing on the left side. And that demonstrates that proximal to the area that we are visualizing, there is acute venous thrombus in that iliac vein. Another example of asymmetry is, uh, are these two uh, uh, images. This is the right and left sides uh, of the popliteal veins, and we see there's loss of respiratory phasicity on the left side compared to the right side, even though we have good augmentation. Again, looking at it uh, more closely, uh, we can see the loss of respiratory physicity on the left compared to the right, and that tells us that there is a proximal abnormality which we have not yet visualized. It's a partially occluding thrombus in the popliteal vein because we still have good augmentation indicating it's not completely occluding the vessel lumen proximally. What about isolated calf vein thrombosis again? The incidence, as I stated, in asymptomatic patients is high, up to 88%. Upward propagation occurs, however, only in around 20%. So calf clot is unlikely to lead to significant pulmonary emboli. It's important also to appreciate the fact that if the initial examination is normal, in 2% of patients, abnormalities are evident on serial testing. So even if an examination is completely normal, we may have missed one of the duplicated calf veins, which one may not have been visualized, and the thrombus may have propagated proximally. It's very important to realize uh, that if a patient has unilateral symptoms, is it appropriate or inappropriate to do a bilateral examination? If a patient uh, has uh, DVT on an affected side, in 5 to 22 percent of the patients, the unaffected limb or the asymptomatic limb will have an associated DVT as well. In contrast to that, if the symptomatic leg is negative, clot will occur in less than 1 percent of patients who are on the asymptomatic side. So as a result of this, uh, yeah, most people still do a bilateral examination but if you want, if you were stretched for time, if the symptomatic leg is negative, then you don't necessarily have to do the contralateral side. An example uh, is this one. Uh, we're seeing acute venous thrombosis involving the superficial femoral and popliteal vessels on the right side, and this is the symptomatic side. And when we looked at the left side, we saw extensive DVT.
in the left common femoral vein. What about patients who have bilateral symptoms? In most patients who have bilateral symptoms, cardiac disease or peripheral vascular disease is the dominant cause. Others have said uh, that we still need to do uh, bilateral examinations because there's a significant incidence in DVT. And this is probably rel related to the fact that these patients also have additional risk factors, as pointed out by John Cronin. How accurate are we in DVT assessments? In the femtopathic area, the sensitivity is 99% and the accuracy is 98%. And for isolated caffeine thrombosis, the accuracy decreases. The false negative rate is again 18%. So what does that mean? Uh, in particular, the true negative rate for our assessments is 96%, but that means that the false negative rate cannot be, is at approximately 4%, meaning, again, that if the examination is negative, it doesn't mean if the patient is sim remains symptomatic that you should not perform the examination again. You may have a, a patient who has one of these false negative examinations. And a, and we are not 100% in any of these assessments. So in, in summary, with regard to uh, the upper the lower extremities, if a patient has unilateral swelling, the most common diagnosis will be acute DVT. Less commonly, you'll find some other abnormalities at around 10% of the time, including ruptured Baker cysts and musculoskeletal injuries. If the patient has bilateral acute symptoms, most commonly it'll be congestive failure, but less commonly, but not insignificantly, it will be patients who have bilateral DVT. Let's move on to the upper extremities. The incidence appears to be increasing with increased uh, use of central venous catheters and PICC lines. Also, other risk factors include pacemaker wires, uh, as well as underlying malignancy and hypercoagulable states. What are the vessels we should be assessing? These include the brachial veins, uh, cephalic veins, axillary, and some clavian veins, as well as the internal jugulars. It's important to appreciate that the axillary and some clavian veins are usually anterior to the arteries. And that's a way to be certain that you're looking at the correct vessel. Veins usually are touching the arteries. Compression should occur also with using the linear ray transducer the same way that you you attempt to compress the veins in the lower extremities. And if you can't compress uh, the veins, as you frequently can't, in the medial component of the subclavian veins, you could try using the sniffing maneuver, which will cause the subclavian vein to decrease, or using the valsalva maneuver, and causing the subclavian vein to increase in size. Here's an example of a subclavian vein, uh, an artery, and we are compressing uh, the vein with direct pressure using the linear H transducer. An example of acute DVT in the upper extremity, frequently these can be a little more echogenic than they are in the lower extremity, and here we're seeing flow surrounding the acute DVT in the subclavian vein. In a jugular vein, both sagittal, a transverse and sagittal projection, we're seeing acute DVT which did not compress. Here is a, an example of a Hickman catheter which we visualized in the subclavian vein and we can see the acute venous thrombosis touching and immediately adjacent to this, uh, to this uh, catheter. We also want to look for symmetry in the rest of the spectrum analysis pattern uh, with, uh, in these uh, patients to be certain that we're not missing a proximal thrombus as, we, as we've pointed out in the lower extremities. Another cause also of asymmetry in uh, the subclavian veins particularly is imaging a collateral vessel when you haven't visualized the subclavian vein at all. Here's an example again of asymmetry, loss of respiratory phases sitting on the right compared to the left. This would suggest that there could be a proximal thrombus on the right or more, more commonly as we see, or, or as occurring in this case, this actually represents a collateral vessel rather than the subclavian vessel, which the technologist originally thought. Moving on to another cause of vascular emergencies, that includes torsion, and we are talking about both torsion of the testes and ovaries. Testicular torsion, occur, torsion occurs most commonly in infants and adolescent boys, and the clinical symptoms include a triad of pain, swelling, and uh, uh, 
erythematous uh, abnormalities on the scrotum itself without any history of trauma. Usually the affected testis is enlarged and in 10% uh, early of patients with early torsion, the examination is completely normal. The ultrasound findings are decreased asymmetrical or absent blood flow. The uh, findings are relate to the degree of torsion of the uh, vessels. If it's at 540 degrees at least, then there's complete arterial and venous occlusion. If it's less than 360 degrees, you can get venous occlusion and may still have arterial flow but uh, with some dampening and loss of diast the diastolic component. Sometimes you may have complete detorsion and you may have both arterial and venous flow. Another abnormality to look for with ultrasound is the spiral twist or the torsion knot, uh, which you can frequently visualize cranial to the testis itself. This is an example of both the right and left testes. The right is obviously larger than the left side, and this is the patient who had torsion. Another patient on the right side was seeing lack of vascular flow on the right compared to the left. Uh, and I would recommend always starting with the asymptomatic side so you could set up the color and Doppler spectrum analysis and then you know you should expect to see normal flow on the, the symptomatic side. So here's an example of torsion on the right again. Some examples of a torsion knot, the increased uh, abnormality superior to the testis itself, which needs to be separated from the epididymis. And one of the keys to that is the lack of color enhancement in the epididymis in, a, in, in patients with a torsion knot in contrast to uh, patients who have epididymitis and have increased uh, flow in uh, the epididymis. Ovarian torsion also is caused by complete or incomplete rotation of the pedicle. Uh, this results in compromised venous uh, lymphatic drainage, leading to edema and congestion of the parenchyma and ultimately loss of arterial flow. This occurs in normal ovaries as well as ovaries which have a, a pre-existing uh, cysts or benign masses. It also occurs in patients who have enlarged ovaries uh, in pregnancy frequently with corpus luteum cysts. And the clinical symptoms are the patients who present with pain, nausea, and vomiting and most commonly it occurs on the right. The ovary is lodged uh, on ultrasound. There are multiple follicles frequently. There are several. Sometimes there will simply be a cyst, and there sometimes is free fluid in the cul-de-sac. Using color flow Doppler, which is very important, there's absent flow in the affected side or asymmetric flow. You may have arterial flow and absent venous flow as well. And frequently you'll be able to see the uh, vascular pedicle. And again, look for symmetry, symmetry in the Doppler spectrum analysis pattern. Here we have torsion on the right in an enlarged right ovary compared to the left ovary. Here we have another patient with abnormal flow pattern on the right compared to normal arterial and normal venous flow on the left. Again, you see dampening on this right uh, uh, ovary. Another cause of emergencies uh, uh, that are sent to us are patients with pulsatile abdominal uh, masses, and these include aortic aneurysms as well as groin masses. Ultrasound, of course, is not the procedure of choice for patients with rupturing abdominal aortic aneurysms. CT is the is a required study that needs to be done, uh, but frequently we're asked to assess patients who have a pulsatile mass to determine if there is an aortic aneurysm present. Again, remember, you to, to measure uh, the aorta accurately, you need to be perpendicular to the long axis of the vessel and measure the outer to outer lumen. Here's an example of an aortic aneurysm, which we're measuring the outer to outer lumen. Uh, and uh, again, ultrasound is a very accurate assessment of aortic aneurysms. Similarly, we can uh, assess popliteal pul pulsatile masses. This is an example of a popliteal artery aneurysm. And by definition, these are uh, vessels that have a uh, diameter of greater than one a centimeter. Color flow Doppler is very valuable in the assessment of differentiating pseudoaneurysm from a hematoma in the common femoral artery or the femoral artery. The classic pattern is a yin yang pattern, which most people are familiar with. The, the uh, good example here of this patient who had a cardiac catheterization and had a, a pulsatile mass, and you're seeing with color flow Doppler the yin yang pattern within the aneurysm. 
here we see the ingress and egress of flow causing that yin-yang pattern. Again, be very careful, don't have uh, just tunnel vision. Here we're seeing a patient who has a, uh, definitely a pseudoaneurysm, classic yin-yang pattern, uh, but also had acute DVT in the superficial femoral vein, uh, which was non-compressible. So again, you can get more than one problem uh, and be well aware that uh, ultrasound is uh, capable of assessing both these abnormalities. Moving on, another cause of vascular emergencies are change in neurologic symptoms. This relates to the identifying most commonly heterogeneous plaque in a patient who is having a TIA. To, to digress for a moment, there are two different types of plaque. One is fibrous collagenous plaque, which is stable, and the second is plaque which contains intraplaque hemorrhage and is thought to be unstable or vulnerable. There are two methods of assessment in the international system, which divides plaque into four different types of characteristics, and the heterogeneous, homogeneous pattern, uh, which uh, is useful and most, most frequently used in the United States. The heterogeneous pattern overlaps the type 1 and type 2 uh, type of uh, plaques, uh, and the Type 3 and Type 4 international system plaques fit into the homogeneous pattern category. Now why is characterization so important? It's because, again, the heterogeneous type of plaque appears to be the vulnerable plaque, the type that will break uh, down and embolize more, and when patients present with the TIA, they may be undergoing that process. This was demonstrated very clearly in a, a patient, in a study done by Nicolaitis, who followed patients who had been had their plaque classified, and followed them with CT. All these patients had greater than 50% stenosis, and the type uh, one plaque, which is heterogeneous, had a 66% incidence of CT infarction compared to patients who had type four plaque, which was homogeneous and had a 10.5 in incidence of. CT infarction. So what do these different types of plaques look like? Homogeneous plaque is uniform, has low well level echoes, and again, is less than 50% sonolucent. Here's an example uh, with a pathologic specimen. Here's the residual lumen. Here's the carotid bulb. It is homogeneous, has a few small sonolucent areas, and pathologically, there was just fibrous collagenous plaque, no evidence of intraplaque hemorrhage. Another example, a sagittal and transverse image, and both uh, methodologies need to be used in order to classify plaque. Uh, you could see that we have uh, relatively uniform plaque with any degree of sonolucency within it. This is homogeneous type 4 plaque. In this transverse uh, image and sagittal image, we see a very small residual lumen on this transverse image, but with some areas of sonolucency, but small areas of sonolucency relative to the volume of the plaque itself and this is type 3 homogeneous plaque. Again, it's important to emphasize plaque characterization can only be done in grayscale, and you cannot classify plaque using color or power. Heterogeneous plaque looks differently. Most importantly, it has more than 50% sonolucency, and it can either have a smooth or an irregular surface. Here we're seeing a considerable hypochoic plaque in this area with an irregular margin, and you can appreciate that just more than 50% of this volume is sonolucent. Here's a, another example, internal and external carotid arteries. Here's a residual lumen of the internal carotid artery marked off, and here is the outer margin, which is completely sonolucent. This would therefore be type 1 heterogeneous plaque, and there's pathologic specimen. You can see the large amount of intraplaque hemorrhage, which was visualized in this endarterectomy specimen. In another patient, here you can see the residual lumen on this power Doppler image, but again, you must classify it with grayscale, and you can see that there's large amounts of heterogeneous plaque uh, here. Uh, this is type 2, because there are some, uh, there's both homogeneous and there is both low-level uniform echoes and big focal sonolucent areas of plaque. Again, this is appreciated in the sagittal image of the same patient. Here is the residual lumen. We see the outlines of where the plaque must be, but we classify it with grayscale alone, and we see the large areas of 
So the lucency within the plaque, more than 50% of the volume, but not completely 100%, and this therefore is type 2 heterogeneous plaque. So in summary, the characterization pattern consists primarily of the degree of sonolucency. Heterogeneous plaque is more than 50% sonolucent. Calcifications can occur in both. Surface can, only, can be either smooth or irregular with heterogeneous plaque. Now why is this important? Again, it's important because the heterogeneous plaque is an independent risk factor uh, for, for uh, vascular emergencies and stroke. Independent, uh, the two independent risk factors are degree of stenosis and degree of uh, sonolucency. And so it's my recommendation that patients with TIAs be sent to assess the plaque, both the volume of the plaque as well as the degree of heterogeneity. The second uh, cause of vascular emergencies uh, with, related to changing neurological symptoms relates to patients with uh, secondary signs of, uh, who have uh, cerebral infarction. Here is a patient with a very narrowed uh, uh, internal carotid artery. We're seeing the residual lumen, which is very narrowed. Uh, when we look at the spectrum of the internal carotid, of the, uh, internal carotid, we see low velocities, which correlates with a high degree of stenosis, greater than uh, 95%. We see low velocities in the common as well as the internal carotid artery, and we see dampening not only of the common, which would go along with a very tight stenosis of the internal carotid artery, but also in the internal carotid artery itself completely. This indicates to us that there not only is there a significant stenosis in the carotid bulb itself that we've visualized, and these are the velocities which were present in this patient, peak velocity in the internal of 69, and the systolic ratio of 2.6, but also this tells us since there is dampening and no diastolic flow in the internal carotid artery, that there is a distal stenosis uh, as we see here in this CTA. Moving on, there are some unusual vascular uh, emergencies we are frequently sent. Frequently we're sent to assess patients who have uh, ascites from the emergency room to identify if they have uh, but Chiari syndrome or some other vascular abnormalities, and occasionally patients with abdominal pain, uh, also who they don't uh, uh, think have aortic aneurysms. Here we're seeing a patient with a large amount of ascites, and we're seeing, in fact, that this patient uh, has reverse flow in the uh, portal vein. And when we assess this patient more carefully, not only was there reverse flow in the portal vein, but also there was. Uh, thrombus in all the hepatic veins, although there was a patent in inferior vena cava, and this was an example of a patient with Bud Chiari syndrome. This was a 35-year-old lady who we later identified to have a hypercoagulable state and ultimately had to go on to a liver transplant. But this is how she presented with acute onset of ascites and ultimately an acute diagnosis of Bud Chiari syndrome. Dissection of the aorta is uh, most commonly idiopathic. Uh, although some causes can occur with Marfan syndrome, pregnancy, uh, and focal stenosis, hypertension, and bicuspid or aortic valve patients. Typically, it begins in the thorax, extends all the way into the abdomen, and it relates to a defect in the intima. And sometimes we also see blood flow in uh, both uh, the false and true lumen of the uh, vessel. Here is an example of an aortic dissection. We can see the uh, flap. Uh, which was fluttering on real time, although we did not see um, uh, bidirectional flow in the aorta with color flow itself. Another example in another patient, here is the intimal flap in this aorta, and uh, again, uh, in, uh, transversely in this vessel as well. So in summary, we've gone through a large number of vascular emergencies. Uh, we look, discussed deep venous thrombosis, torsion, pulsatile vascular masses, acute changes in neurologic symptoms, and unusual vascular problems. In conclusion, ultrasound is a useful tool to evaluating vascular emergencies. The most commonly requested procedure is the upper and lower extremity DVT studies. And in around 10% of these patients, ultrasound is valuable because we're also going to identify another cause, such as ruptured baker cysts, aneurysms, lymphoma, or hip uh, hematomas. Torsion of the ovaries and testes can be accurately diagnosed with ultrasound, and you must use Doppler spectrum analysis to evaluate for both arterial and venous flow.
You certainly can't look at the color flow alone and know that there's arterial and venous flow. Patients with TIAs can be sent to evaluate for the presence of an unstable heterogeneous plaque, and it's something I would recommend. Pulsatile masses can be accurately assessed with ultrasound, and pseudoaneurysms have a characteristic yin-yang pattern, which is visualized.